uh, have not addressed whether or not the in the War Powers Act resolution, uh, of course, is very complex uh, and has a variety of reporting provisions as well as the more difficult provision involving uh, the withdrawal of troops. Um, I think that the uh, as I think I may have alluded to in our conversation earlier uh, in, in private that the whole issue of when what the president's authority is as opposed to the authority of Congress uh, seems to be one that is more amenable to the kind of process that this body and the executive uh, went through or engaged in uh, in the Persian Gulf conflict. That is one in which uh, the conflict is resolved in the political context. Uh, I don't think there's certainly uh, not very much um, in the way of judicial um, precedent or judicial uh, consideration of this particular issue. And as I've noted before, there's a, a, an ongoing debate among scholars on, on both sides of the issue. Um, I, for one, just as I have viewed the issue, as I've looked at it, uh, it, it seems to be one of those instances in which the, the differences, uh, uh, particularly when there's an existing conflict, are better worked out in cooperation between the executive and the, uh, and the uh, legislative branches. Well, Judge Thomas, I agree with you totally that it's better to work them out, but that issue could come before the court. and. A concern which I have expressed is your statements uh, suggesting a lack of wisdom in the Congress, and I know you have already said that you will be fair and impartial, and that what you had said in the past was as an advocate as opposed to where you stand as a judge, so I don't think there's any use in pursuing that, uh, that one any further. Now let me turn to a specific case which you have decided, uh, Judge. Uh, although you did not write the opinion, it's a case of some significance involving the United States versus Jose Lopez. And it is a case which involves the interpretation of socioeconomic status under the uniform sentencing guidelines, which have been enacted to try to bring uniformity on sentences in criminal cases. And those guidelines say that socioeconomic status should not be uh, considered on the sentencing issue. And the facts in this case were very compelling about Mr. Lopez in terms of his own background, where, as the opinion of the court said, the tragic circumstances involved the death of his mother by his stepfather murdering her his own threats that he had to leave town to avoid problems, his growing up in the slums of New York and Puerto Rico, and of not fitting in because of his dual background. The United States attorney prosecuting the case on behalf of the government and asking for a tough sentence argued that, and this is also from the opinion, quote, the government urges that a focus on particular life experiences would permit every defendant to distinguish himself from all others unless would undermine the purpose of the uniformity of sentencing procedures. You were on the panel which upheld an expansion of the sentencing guidelines which prohibited considering socioeconomic circumstances. And my question to you is, how far do you think it is appropriate to go in that line? And was the United States attorney prosecuting the case and asking for a tough sentence really totally wrong in the concern expressed that it would permit every defendant to distinguish himself from all others and thus undermine the purposes of uniformity in the guidelines? Um, the Concern, as you indicated, um, Senator, I didn't write the opinions, and um, joined in the opinion. I joined in the opinion. Um, um, after a while, you learn that uh, when you don't write, after about 150 or 200 of these cases, it's they're a little hard to recall. But this case was a difficult case. Uh, it's one that um, took into account the 
notion or the, the uh, concern that this body uh, had that sentences be uniform, that uh, there not be wide disparities in sentences. Uh, at the same time, the question was when there is an individual such as Mr. Lopez uh, who has had very um, um, difficult and traumatic circumstances in um, his or her life, is this a factor that is not socioeconomic? Is it, um, even though it may have resulted from socioeconomic status, that is where he lived, are these factors that should be considered? And I think what the court did uh, in that case, and I haven't had an opportunity to review that opinion, um, is to wrestle with that difficult issue, but also to recognize that there was in the uniform guidelines a prohibition against considering socioeconomic status. Um, and I think ultimately feeling compelled to uh, um, 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 comply with the, that requirement. Judge Thomas, the issue of the death penalty has not arisen in these proceedings except for one reference earlier to federal court habeas corpus, but that is a very important subject. Uh, there are deep-seated differences of opinion on the matter. I was a district attorney in Philadelphia for many years and believe the death penalty is a deterrent. Uh, philosophically, is there anything about the application of the death penalty which uh, uh, would bother you from upholding it if confirmed for the Supreme Court? Uh, philosophically, uh, Senator, there is nothing that uh, would bother me personally about upholding it in appropriate uh, cases. My concern, of course, would always be that we provide all of the uh, available protections and accord all of the uh, uh, protections available uh, to a uh, criminal defendant who is uh, uh, exposed to or sentenced to the death penalty. Well, since Furman versus Georgia, there have been elaborate circumstances set up for consideration of all the mitigating circumstances, but there has been a concern beyond the imposition of the death penalty in terms of it's not violating the Eighth Amendment to cruel and unusual punishment, and I'm frankly pleased to hear your answer that you would support it in the appropriate case. There's been another concern about tremendous delay, in some cases as long as 17 years, an average of eight and a half years. And there are pen proposals pending, which I have authored, which would set time limits within the federal system to give an opportunity in the federal court for a full hearing, uh, but to make it a priority case because it is really uh, watched by so many people as to whether law enforcement is really serious in carrying out penalties. And one of the legislative provisions calls for a time limit in the Supreme Court to decide these matters within 90 days unless the case is so unusual that it requires an extension of time in which event the court could take longer on stated reason. But I have two questions for you. One is, and people said this was too much for Congress to do because the court didn't sit in the summertime. And the response to that was, well, the court could sit in the summertime like uh, other courts do. And my question to you is, do you think that Congress has the authority to establish a timetable as we have under the Speedy Trial Act, for example? And secondly, to try to abbreviate whether 90 days is a reasonable time, or if not, what time limit would be? Um, the, of course, there is precedent, as you've uh, alluded to, Senator, for establishing time frames, whether or not um, Congress has the authority to do it in this particular case. Uh, I have not uh, had an opportunity to think about, uh, but Congress certainly has established time frames in a procedural way uh, that governs the way federal courts on, on, at the district court level um, it's certainly in our rules of civil procedure on, on the that govern the way that we do, our, the, govern the way that we do business. The Speedy Trial Act, I think, is the best example, the one best example. Um, the question as to whether or not 90 days is the appropriate time, I don't know. 
my concern would be 